Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining today. Um, We're so excited to have you here. Um, you know, we're especially excited because we know how the last seven months have been and having so many Zoom calls and many of you probably have Zoom fatigue. So we really, really do appreciate you joining us at the conference uh, today and hopefully you'll be here again tomorrow. Um, I am Julie Montgomery and I'm the Vice President of Membership um, and Partnerships at SID Washington. And you are here at the first learning lab, which includes four sessions that are focused on learning and being more interactive. Um, and, and hopefully you'll be able to um, interact with the other participants. Um, so they're slightly different from our traditional panel sessions that are happening during the conference. Um, today we have Joanne Sunnishine. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Connective Impact. Um, and she will be facilitating our session today on how effective partnerships are addressing the SDGs. Um, so Joanne started um, her company, um, which is a company that focuses on international development partnership, partnership strategy and, fun, and it's a fundraising advisory firm. And she has a real passion for partnership development. Um, I know her bio is on, uh, on the site, so I thought I'd just say a few things about her that are not in her bio. Four things. So first, uh, Joanne started her career in investment banking. She's written two books over the last three years. She's an only child and she's an avid Cleveland Browns football fan. Um, and you know, when I asked her about her mem most memorable uh, place that she's traveled to and why, because uh, I wanted to share something more personal about her, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit what she said. So she said, when she was living and working in London, she traveled to Turkey and that experience really was monumental for her um, because it was the first time she had encountered so many diverse cultures and backgrounds and it allowed her to see the world from a very, very much different place than, and lens than ever before. Um, since then, uh, she has now a passion uh, for traveling and she has traveled to virtually every continent and more than 30 countries and she's anxious to see more. So I am now going to turn it over to Joanne um, and thank you again for being here. Hi everyone. Good morning, Julie. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I am so thrilled to be here with all of you for the SIDS first virtual conference. Uh, my company, Connective Impact, is really pleased to be a sponsor of the conference, um, and we are an institutional member of SID. I personally have participated in SID events for years. Uh, I've been in Washington for almost 20 of them, and I would say SID has been in my life in various ways um, over the course of those two decades. So it's, it's really a thrill uh, to be here and I really value everything that Sid is doing to, to join us here together. Um, I would ask as we get started, and I'm gonna be sharing my screen shortly, that the intent is for this to be interactive. So we will have a polling question. We're gonna have a couple of breakouts. Um, they'll be quick. So in the meantime, feel free to use the chat box. Please you know, include your name, the organization that you're with. If you have anything that you do wanna share as we go, particularly as we come out of the breakouts, I'll prompt you a little bit to do that, but please feel free to, to do some of that on your own. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started here. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see me or see the screen, I should say. Um, Julie, let me know if you cannot see this, but I will assume if I don't hear you, whoops, I'll assume if I don't hear you, then you can see everything fine. Great. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about effective partnerships for the SDGs. Um, and I'm, I think this is really timely. We are about five years into the development of the Sustainable Development Goals. And essentially we have another 10 years to deliver um, on the initial goals as they were set out. So what we're going to go through today is um, over the first kind of 15 to 20 minutes, um, I will run through some slides. We'll have a breakout or two. It may take us a bit longer, but um, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and an opportunity to dialogue again. Let's see. Okay, just briefly about me, and, and thanks, Julie, for mentioning a couple of fun facts. Um, so yes, Connective Impact is a partnership strategy advisory firm based just outside of Washington um, in Arlington focusing on helping companies, NGOs, and donors partner with each other 
to deliver on the SDGs. And I've spent really the last 20 years working, as I mentioned, here in Washington in various forms, but always on sustainability policy and international development. And I've been a fundraiser in one shape or form for most of those years, working with donors of all types and helping advance this notion that fundraising is really about building strong partnerships. So when I talk about the idea of partnerships, I'm really talking about fundraising and strategic partnership. And I like getting away from this idea that fundraising is merely transactional. So when um, today we talk about funders and donors, please keep in mind that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about them as strategic partners. So while my expertise is in this kind of space of international fundraising and partnership, I would say the same principles that we talk about today really cover, you know, all issues around business development or partnerships, no matter what role you play. Um, and I know based on the participants at SID, we have people in biz dev, we have fundraisers, we even have folks from private sector um, and academics. So I hope that you find the session valuable. So I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. If you're not, um, they are right here in front of you. You've probably seen this image a million times. And as you likely know, addressing issues like poverty, like hunger, clean water, quality education, health, et cetera, um, it really takes all of us working together if we're going to kind of adjust the way that our planet is responding to many of these challenges. Obviously, COVID has made each of these 17 SDGs even more complicated. And that is why finding the right partners to advance these goals is so critical. And, you know, I, I often think about um, the SDGs as the, the keys to making our planet more peaceful, sustainable and where we can all thrive. And I do believe that if we work together, we can get there, but it's gonna take a lot over the next 10 years to get us there. Um, in fact, I was reading this morning that if we are on the pace, the current pace that we're on to address the SDGs, not only will we not be able to achieve them by 2030, but we may not even be able to achieve you know, any of the impact that we're trying to make according to all of these 17 SDGs until nearly the year 2100, which is just mind boggling when you think that it's gonna take us at least another 100 years, almost another 100 years to uh, manage some of these challenges. So we really need action and we need to advance these together. Um, so I, you know, I think there's, there's a couple of ways to, um, to look at the SDGs. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, one kind of method of partnership that I like to work on with the, the organizations that I work on. And I'll also be sharing some results from a survey that I um, delivered this summer with a number of corporations. But before we get there, I did want to bring up a poll and see among uh, those of you in the audience how many of you are actually working on the SDGs through partnerships. So if you could pull up the poll, here is the question. Are you currently prioritizing the SDGs in your partnerships? Let's see what folks have to say. Okay. Let's give you another 10, 15 seconds to answer. Okay, so it looks like most of you are either always or sometimes prioritizing the SDGs in your partnership. So go ahead if you feel like it, put in the chat box some cases where you may be prioritizing SDGs in your partnerships and other cases where maybe you're, you're kind of not really sure or um, you know, it depends on the situation and we can uh, come back to that. So let me just figure out how to get this off. There we go. All right. So as I mentioned, to kind of better understand how different types of organizations have been thinking about partnerships for the sustainable development goals, as well as how COVID and ongoing challenges with 
economic prosperity and racial justice have, a, have kind of um, impacted how these organizations are thinking about partnerships for the SDGs. We spent some time over the summer speaking with executives within a bride, wide breadth of mission-driven organizations, um, asking them questions about how partnerships have evolved with the SDGs. And a sampling of the companies that we talked to are here. This is not everyone. This is just a sample. Um, and when we get into the Q&A, I can put the link for the full report that we produced according to these interviews in the chat box. Um, but we asked questions about how are these companies partnering? What makes partnerships effective? How are they prioritizing the SDGs and more? Um, and I, as we go through some of the slides, I'm gonna uh, review some of their responses, but it's been really interesting to see how these companies are looking at partnership, what's been working and where are there some challenges. So as a start, here is a summary of what the respondents are focused on currently. So you can see there's a wide range of priorities and obviously we just asked about the 17 SDGs. We asked our interviewers to categorize what some of their, their top priorities are over the next three to five years. We couch this recognizing that there's a lot of unknowns with COVID. There's a lot of unknowns like politically. Um, and you can see that no poverty, decent work and economic equities responsible consumption and production and climate action are clearly the highest priorities among our interviewees. It was also clear that, I mean, in every interview that we had, every company said they could not address those priority SDGs alone and that they absolutely had to rely upon their partners. And so when we asked them, how many partners are you currently working with? to address the SDGs or to address your impact goals. Um, many companies have been working with their partners for years and they've been working kind of in a variety of, um, with a variety of numbers of partners. So you can see that the big um, kind of chasm between 20 and 100 partners. And what we were told is that some partnerships are new, um, some partnerships are quite old and have been, these, these organizations have been working together, together for a long time. There was a recognition that finding the right partner takes experimentation, experimentation and patience, um, and that being clear on why you would partner uh, is really necessary. And so we'll talk about that in, in a minute. But one thing I do wanna mention is that for those companies working with fewer than 20 companies, many are concentrating their SDG specific work working with those partnerships that they consider to be long-term, well-vetted, and high impact. And one thing I'll notice, I'll note is that COVID hasn't really seemed to kind of pause this long-term thinking around SDGs. Indeed, short-term efforts have been paused or adjusted, or in some cases, completely scrapped. But by and large, long-term focus on the SDGs remains a priority. So in thinking about what makes effective partnerships for the SDGs, finding the right donor or partner to advance big picture goals in some cases can feel like a chase and it can feel like a game. And this becomes even more challenging in a time of conflict or crisis. And one thing, you know, it doesn't have to be that way, but the reality is that most of us do feel it day in and day out in the roles that we play. This is true for organizations of all sizes and scope. This is true no matter where you're operating or what type of, of work that you're doing. Sometimes it's just hard to really even know when, when to start or who to start with. And that was something that our interviewees mentioned was an ongoing challenge, especially during volatile times is how do you even begin? So knowing which partners are worthy of engaging is based largely on understanding their priorities and at the same time being very clear on your own. And it's hard to know what other organizations are looking to engage in sometimes unless information is publicly available or you have an in and that person gives you intel. And sometimes it's just guesswork to find potential partners. So how do you make sure that you find the right partners who will help you make the impact that you're looking for? What we do know is that finding funding partners or partners of any type can be made easier by knowing the right people inside an organization. I mean, that's kind of what, you know, we all kind of work towards. And while that isn't always the case, it definitely helps. But then how do you make yourself relevant even if you know someone and you have an in? So there is a way to address these questions, finding the right partner, 
donor, strategic partner to address the SDGs is really about finding an intersection of interests, priorities, need, and anticipated gain. It's about aligning visions, being clear about your mission, and identifying the specific area of mutual benefit that will deliver to both or all of your organizations before agreeing to partner. How does this work in practice? Let's start by examining what your priorities are. From there, by creating a simple Venn diagram that maps your priorities to those that you're trying to partner with, you can start to identify opportunities to engage. So you really must begin by finding that area of green, agreeing to what specifics are and then delivering accordingly. How do you find that area of green and what does it look like? What shape does it take? Who resides within that area over overlap for your organization? We are going to talk about that today. So we're gonna start off by examining how effective partnership works. This includes where to begin by clarifying your own priorities. Why are you in need of partners in the first place? What are you trying to achieve? Consider what you are doing already, where you have needs, how your efforts to address the, the sustainable de development goals, the SDGs, are already advancing and where you may need additional support. Are you purely looking for funding or is there a broader need that you have that's technical? Are you just looking to replicate what's already working? Do you need to engage a thought leadership partner or even a competitor? Pre-competitive collaboration does help us advance big picture goals, so don't discount that. But identifying the one to two issues and really no more, I, I mean, I can't emphasize that enough, one to two issues at a time that your organization, <clears throat> excuse me, simply cannot address alone is absolutely the first step in effective partnership for the SDGs. After that, you can identify a gap filler. The type of partners you seek will depend on your need. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna break out into groups of six. We're gonna spend six minutes. And within your breakout, you're gonna be randomly divided. I want you to talk about one of your priorities that you have where you know that a partnership is necessary. I want you to talk about, you know, if, if it's in the area of fundraising or project implementation, that's great. But maybe there's some other categories where partnerships are gonna be really critical. So. Let's go ahead and break out for six minutes and then we'll come back. Are we ready for the breakouts?
Excellent. Welcome back. Um, so we we lost a few folks, but we're going to keep keep going through it. And one of the things that um, we talked about that I thought was interesting in our breakout session was how you kind of look at the lens of partnership. So do you come to a partnership with this lens of what do you need and how can I help you? Or do you come to a partnership with the lens of here's what I have to offer? which is a very different um, kind of approach. And so, you know, one thing that, that we found that works quite well is actually if you start looking through the needs that you have and you begin with a priority setting exercise from your own sense of, um, you know, impact goals, objectives, outcomes that you'd like to see in as, as an organization, and you are proactive about bringing those to potential partners, it's less responsive and it's more proactive. So. That's what we're gonna get back into as we go back into the uh, presentation. <clears throat> so let's see here. Okay. So I'm going to just turn my video on. Okay, cool. So maybe you've now been able to figure out why you're partnering, right? You've established your priorities. You, you've identified clearly, as we kind of talked about, you know, that you, ha you are absolutely need a gap filler. And let me just show you again this slide. You know, where are you already delivering impact? What do you know is working well? Where are there opportunities to scale? Where are there clear gaps? Then the next question is, who's the gap filler? The first step is going to be relying upon one of my favorite economic concepts, which is comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is the ability of an individual or group to carry out a particular economic activity more efficiently than another activity. So you want to look for complementary organizations, those that can help you fill in your gaps around your SDG goals or priorities. How does this work in practice? So this idea of comparative advantage is about figuring out, as we mentioned, what needs you have first then you start thinking about where you're gonna be able to fill in the gaps of a prospective partner. So again, thinking first about what you bring to the table and then secondly, thinking about what they can bring to your organization. This is about mutual benefit and it's about finding this point of intersection. So once you've considered what you can contribute to the sustainable development goals already and where you can be helpful to others, that's when you start to get into this idea of comparative advantage. It's gonna be one of the most critical elements to consider when you're finding the right partner for your goals. And when getting back to the interviews that we held with um, the companies that I mentioned at the beginning, we asked them what makes their partnerships kind of effective and could be even more effective in delivering on the SDGs. Um, you can see some of the responses here, but one trend that I noticed throughout the discussions that we had is an interest in speed, efficiency, and being proactive. Now, this isn't entirely surprising because a lot of the organizations that we interviewed were corporates, and corporates obviously operated a very different timeline than NGOs necessarily. But there was definitely this sense that if you have an aligned vision, you have leadership buy-in, and an opportunity to scale that you're going to have kind of more opportunity to make a difference than if you're working in silos or you're working independently. So what, let's start to think about which partner you want to rely upon for your SDG um, goals and outcomes. As you're considering again what needs you have, this is where you begin evaluating the universe of potential partners. So you've identified your priorities, you've realized that you need a gap filler. Then the question is, what is your specific ask? What's your need? This is where you start to determine whether you add value to the prospective partner's needs as well. There's obviously a dearth of partnership types to explore and evaluate in each of these partner types. I mean, this is just a sampling. They're gonna have their own approaches to the SDGs. Governments are going to work very differently around the SDGs than maybe a foundation or an academic institution or certainly a corporate. Um, and you may already have partners that you're working with. You may have to start from the beginning. But the idea is to kind of look at this dearth of partnership types and think about what you're going to bring to a partnership that adds value to them versus your needs. And even if you're looking straight for funding, don't discount the, the role that you play 
in bringing technical expertise or other types of value to other organizations. So comparative advantage is going to be really dependent on doing your research. So thinking about kind of how do you kind of understand what's out there? Who's going to help you identify the types of partners if you're starting from scratch or if you're trying to evaluate some of your existing partnerships, you are going to need to do your research. And these are just a couple of questions you might want to ask yourself as you're beginning to look at the dearth of partnerships. Who is in your immediate network and who's around you? What's publicly available? Who are connectors that are out there that can help identify <laughs> potential partners? Oh, can you put yourself on mute, please? Got some folks not on mute, thank you. Um, how do you use social media to help evaluate kind of the types of partners that you want to engage with? So again, this is really about finding that, that point of intersection, that point of mutual benefit. And once you've kind of landed on the type of partners that you need or are seeking, you've kind of identified this, you know, the, the blue box to your red box or the blue sphere to your red sphere, then the next question is how do you come up with the center, the center green area? Sorry, I'm losing, lost my notes here for a sec. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna break out into groups again, as I want you to start thinking about as you're looking at this slide. So imagine you, your organization is the blue sphere. The other organization that you're trying to partner with is the red sphere. What I want you to do in your breakout groups, again, we're gonna break out for about six minutes, is talk about what the green area looks like in an effective partnership. So you can use an existing partnership, you can use a partnership that you're trying to achieve. I want you to brainstorm a little bit. You each can have a minute to brainstorm and start to identify what that area in green looks like. And when we come back, I'll review with you a couple of other responses that we got during our interview with the corporates that I mentioned at the beginning. So let's go ahead and break out into our second breakout group.
Um, so shall I close all the breakout rooms? Yeah, I think we're ready to come back. Okay. Lost my that's here. All right, I think folks are making their way back. So I'm gonna ho go ahead and share my screen again. And I want to go back to some of the slides that I kind of skipped before um, and kind of revisit them. What I'd love for you to do is if you had an opportunity to share uh, an interesting partnership that you've been involved in or something that you've learned by trying to identify kind of that area of mutual benefit that we were talking about, please do put it in the chat box, um, an opportunity to engage with each, other, with each other further about kind of the type of partnerships that are working well and the type of partnerships um, that can be more challenging. And one thing that I, I kind of skipped over because I kind of lost track of my, my notes um, is, you know, as you're thinking about how to, when you're looking at the dearth of partnership types out there and you're trying to figure out where to start, oftentimes, you know, even narrowing in on, do I work with my competitors or should I be working with my supplier? Should I be engaging with nonprofits or should I be engaging with academics? Those questions can feel overwhelming. And so, one of the things that I often recommend is kind of, as I mentioned here, ask others around you. Uh, don't be shy engaging with those in, in this space, whether it's, you know, in your or own organization or with competitors or, and I hate using the word competitor, so I shouldn't say that, but your immediate network of colleague organizations. See what's working well for them. You know, try and find progress reports online, read about partnership successes, read about partnership challenges. Nowadays, partnership engagement is very popular. You can find all sorts of information online. Um, and, you know, as, as we kind of move forward in this notion of collaboration for the SDGs, I would say organizations are becoming very transparent about what's working well and what's not. Longer term partnerships are very keen to kind of publish successes. And so definitely use that to your advantage to understand, um, you know, what type of partnerships work well uh, and what type of partnerships can be more challenging. And once you've landed on the type of partners that you need or are seeking, again, thinking about what value you bring is a must. And so this will help you also narrow in on the list of potential partners. So if you have this, if you kind of imagine this, this wide dearth as we're looking at this slide again, um, or the slide again of, of potential partners, you want to narrow in, right? And the best way to do that is to think about the value that you're going to bring for them and then what the value is they bring for you. The key is to find this green area in the, in the Venn diagram. And you, so you're essentially using the red sphere in this picture as your area of expertise or skill set. So what's the technical kind of benefit that you bring to a partnership? And what's the technical benefit or opportunity that you need that you need to identify in this area for, of green? The blue sphere is then your potential partner or partners. And your task is to work together to come up with the criteria that is then in that area for green. And we're going to move into that right now. So as you're beginning to, to identify that area in green and you're getting involved in partnership dialogue, you know, one thing I heard in one of the breakout sessions I was in is how do you know whether or not to kind of proceed with a partnership or how do you know if they really are the right partner. This is where you're going to want to start to have some very clear advanced discussions before you agree to any type of partnership. So do not wait too long to address things like roles and responsibilities, how you're going to measure joint engagement around the SDGs, what are your M&E strategies, are they at all similar or do they differ? 
you know, how are you going to share lessons learned? How are you going to tell the story of your partnership? These are the type of things that you do want to have preferably in writing before you move forward. And I've often found this is particularly true when I've been working with companies. They want to partner with certain organizations so badly, and maybe their leadership is suggesting that they do so, but they haven't gone through the exercise of figuring out what a partnership is really going to bring kind of to the broader scope of, of the work that they're doing globally. And if it's not agreed to in advance and there isn't you know, a written explanation between each partner about some of these issues, there's gonna be a lack of clarity and there's gonna be confusion. And that's just not the way that you wanna start a partnership off. So you really wanna start on equal footing. And this is the case, even if you're trying to engage with a donor, you wanna to agree to what those partnership commitments look like. You want to agree to expected deliverables. You don't wanna be challenged by anything that's mediocre here. And one suggestion um, that, that I've heard from companies is that oftentimes they're not always sure how to engage with organizations around the SDGs that aren't existing partners. And so it brings a lot of value to them if you have some of this stuff already clarified and you kind of obviously engage in co-creation with them, but you have suggested ways of working together. In talking about evaluation of partnership opportunities, obviously there's a lot to consider. There's a lot of elements that we've already talked about. And there's a lot of elements that I saw in the chat box when I was during the breakout session, things like timelines and budgets and, and pace and culture and how would it engage employees. And it can be overwhelming. Um, sometimes you might feel like there's kind of too much to consider. And I don't want that to get in the way of any type of partnership. Um, or collaboration opportunities. And so one thing I did want to share um, on our website, we have this kind of free, um, this is just a portion of it, but it's an impact, a partnership impact evaluation guide. And it just lays out a couple of things you might want to consider as you're starting to think about partnership alignment, partnership goals, partnership vision. Uh, these type of, of, are, of characteristics are things that I would hope you would consider before you get into a partnership, but are variables that I would encourage you kind of document and writing as you move forward. So I just wanna reiterate how important it is to look at partnership for sustainable development as a true team effort. You and your partners, you and your colleagues, even if you're just looking for funding, the role that you play and the value that you bring cannot be discounted. I'm sure you know, you've heard me now say that so many times, but it's really important. I worked for an NGO for five years and one of the things that I struggled with is that we were always chasing partners. And it felt so responsive. It didn't feel like we were being very proactive. And I truly believe that effective partnership comes when you've got confidence in the value that you add to implementing partners or to co-creation partners. There is a need for any type of value that an organization brings to a partnership and that can't be discounted. And so just to kind of solidify that even further um, and turning back to the interviews that we had this summer with some of the companies that I mentioned about the biggest challenges right now in delivering on SDG commitments, especially given COVID, um, but also given challenges around like racial injustice and economic development. These were some of the things that, um, that they mentioned. And in particular, I want to kind of point out that um, you know, ongoing challenges, pushing companies to think harder about what an intervention looks like that's focused and clear. Uh, it was something that I heard over and over again, this idea of business case and, and alignment, this, this concept that we need to work together for long-term engagement and be very clear up front. I think just kind of reiterate some of the things we've already talked about. And then the last interview slide I did want to show you, by the way, I included the link to the report in the chat box, but I can also send it around afterwards, or if you reach out to me, I can send it to you. We um, are going to have, we have a virtual exhibit hall space, so you can come in there and I can send it to you through the chat box there. Um, but I did want to show you this kind of concept of long-term partnership for the SDGs and what the plans are to continue working with partners given you know, changes brought on by COVID and, and other kind of issues ongoing right now. And here's what they shared. And again, this idea of focus, intention, I, you know, innovation, pushing through, um, you know, focusing on the right partners, really kind of developing relationships and, and building out a partnership that's ba based on testing new ideas 
and really identify in that area in green that we've kind of talked about a couple of times, this area of mutual benefit. That definitely came through um, in the interviews. So before I do kind of get into some of the questions and dialogue, um, I did want to mention a resource that may be useful to some of you as you continue to address your partnerships and fundraising strategies, particularly around the SDGs. And that is our uh, funding and partnerships online community. So this is a membership community of practitioners who are working together on fundraising strategies, proposal development, uh, partnership. This is where we post new funding opportunities on a regular basis and um, share partnership ideas as well as have monthly donor Q and A's. Uh, we're hosting two info sessions on the community. So if you wanna join, I would love to see you. Um, and I think we can, oh, there's my email address if you wanna reach out and we can open it up. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I'm sure there's questions or comments in the chat. So let's, um, we've got about eight minutes. Thanks, uh, Joanne. I think Shabnam's going to um, copy a few of the questions that we have. Um, but just to clarify, we, it, we are technically ending at 1155. Okay. Uh, but if, so Shabnam, if you would um, just put a few of the questions into the chat box. If anyone would like to raise their hand, uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Okay, yeah, so, so far we had three. I'm gonna copy paste all of them here. Okay. Um, the first one was from Mark, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, he asked, so can we delve into the timeline thing a bit more? Our experience is that companies sometimes work just as slowly or more slowly than we do or USAID because of their budget cycles or layers of decision-making. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Well, it's interesting because if you find um, that you're kind of at the right time for their budget cycle, they do want to move fast. But if it's not the right time for their budget cycle, then they do tend to move slower. The thing about companies is that they set, you know, they have their long term kind of SDG goals and then they'll have their shorter term SDG goals and they tend to make decisions in 12 to 18 month increments. And so, yes, their budget cycle is really critical. But if you can kind of get in front of them in order to make some, um, help them make some partnership decisions as they're kind of thinking about their 18 to make 18 months, maybe three year cycle, there is an opportunity to kind of start to develop some short term or even longer term relationships with them. Um, I would say that as companies are starting to compete a little bit more uh, with public funding in terms of like a funding partnership or a funding um, relationship, they're trying to be a lot more dynamic. They're partnering with social enterprises even more frequently than in some cases NGOs. And so the timelines are speeding up quite a bit. Um, but it certainly depends on the type of organization and the type of SDG need that they have identified. Um, so let's see, there's a couple questions. Shabnam, do you want me to wait for you or do you want me to just? Uh, yeah, okay, so the second one was from Ali. Um, he's going off of Mark's question and he said, in our experience, large corporations tend to operate on slower timelines due to stringent bureaucratic contracting processes. Mm -hmm. How can we offer rapid solutions in these partnerships? So great question. This gets to this idea of being proactive. I mean, I feel like I kind of reiterated a number of times how important it is to have your priority set first, the value that you bring set first before you reach out to a potential partner. Um, and so if you know exactly what it is that you're trying to deliver for your own organization, if you've got your goals in line and you're, um, you know, that's clarified, it's going to allow you to bring that forward and say, here's what we offer. Here's what we can do. Here's what we want to do. Here's a partnership idea we have. And it just gets you in front of, of potential partners. They can say yes or no, or we need to think about it. That's fine. But you at least know exactly what you're bringing to the table first, and you're not waiting on all this back and forth. Okay. Um, so the next one is from Sarah. Um, I guess this is more for the general audience, but she said that I would love to hear people's thoughts on the value of partnering with competitors with limited green area. What is the value, if any, and how many, sorry, how much should these types of partnerships be prioritized versus other types of partnerships? So I know we don't have a lot of time. One thing um, I like to think about is if you're working with a community, you know, which most of us are uh, in, a, in a place where the challenges are quite broad, I think about it as Swiss cheese. Where are the holes? If you were to you know, think about like the community and, and you've got a bunch of holes that have been identified, access to clean water, access to health services, access to food. Um, 
who is already working and trying to fill in those gaps? Who's already kind of trying to provide value if it's, if it's competitors? Then the question then becomes how engaging with competitors is going to help fill those holes faster and more efficient. Um, and so if you can identify the type of competitors that are going to be in, you know, able to engage with you in a way that's going to fill the holes in communities that are important to you and that are going to help deliver on the SDGs, then they should be receptive to that. It's finding those gaps that are, that's really critical. So I can talk to you more about that and, and I've got an article I can share um, that kind of talks a little bit about this idea of, of system-based partnership, which kind of goes into that. So I know we have to run. Um, one thing, so I'll turn it over to Julie, but one thing I would say is we can continue the conversation in our exhibit hall. We've got a chat box. Um, join my info session today at one or tomorrow at two. We can talk more about any of this. I shared the slides through the link on the chat box. Happy to share with anybody else that has questions or wanted, wants to chat. But thank you so much for being here and participating. All right, excellent. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Joanne and let's all give Joanne a virtual round of applause for facilitating this great session um, and all her valuable insight shared today. Um, I do also want to thank Akosi, our tech change support person and SID staff, including Shabnam and Thomas. And then finally, thank you, all of you for being here today. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the session. Um, but before we go, I want to remind you of three things. Uh, one, we really value your feedback. So at the end of the conference, please fill out the survey. We um, will send that out to everyone. Um, and you can also find the survey link in the feedback section of the platform. Uh, second, um, if you'd like to stay in touch with Joanne, um, you know, as she said, reach out to her in the virtual exhibit hall, chat with her. Um, you can use a social hour to meet up on the, in the, at the tables. Um, but the recording, the slide deck, and other resources will be available on the site, and we also drop them into the chat box. And then finally, you've got two minutes to go to the networking lounges. So they start at noon. I'd encourage you to, to, to go by social hour um, as there's limited space. Those networking lounges will be open all day, um, but the, in two minutes, it will all be, um, it will be moderated by our co-chairs for 25 um, minutes. So, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you again for being here. Bye everyone. Bye.